my name's Jason Newland. Please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. If you'd like to support me, please go to paypal.me forward slash Jason Newland. Right, so I hope you're well. That's quite a quick introduction, isn't it? Don't worry, it will slow down gradually. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 I've kind of decided that after yesterday, I had a little bit of a, kind of a health scare, kind of, and... But I, I think it was caused, it was brought on by stress and worry and stuff like that. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a little bit of step back from getting all caught up in. Well, I'll tell you what, what was, what's been, blah blah blah. I should be able to articulate myself. I'm kind of not sure where I'm going with these, this free service I do, and ultimately, I just want to make recordings, I just want it to be free, and I want to hopefully help people, that's, that's pretty much the cheese sandwich of it all, that's the basic, you know, all the other stuff, websites, uh, other things, and like, let's plan the future, and let's turn this into a business, and, well, actually, I just want to offer a free service, it's all I've ever wanted to do, really, and even when I try to kind of monetize, you know, by maybe selling some sessions or offering people a chance to download as well as listen for free I still want to offer the free service at the same time which it's not going to work because if you can listen for free why would you pay for the same recording if you can also listen to it for free and I say that because I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't do that <laughs> I wouldn't honestly if I went onto a website and there was a book let's say it was Kindle you know or just for example it was a Kindle book and I could download the book for free or I could I could spend £1.99 knowing that, that that money will go towards that person and you know help them to cover the costs of their service I'd still download the free one probably so I'm in no position to judge anybody really if it's free why wouldn't you have it and and, it, and if anything I'll probably enjoy the book more it's this old uh, idea is if you pay for something you value it well I don't know I mean think about food What's the tastiest meal you ever have? It's free, isn't it? You know, someone gives you, cooks you something, you know, when you're really hungry. Or if you're at work and you, I've been at work in the past where I've not had enough money to bring any food in. And, you know, one of my colleagues has given me a sandwich. Best damn sandwich of my life that was. You know, and that was free. It was free to the degree of like it didn't cost me anything financially, but I didn't realise he was going to be mentioning it, bringing it up for the next two years in conversation. Um, but yeah, other than that, it was free. Not emotionally free, but, you know, financially free. So I've decided. I want to get back to what I do, which I haven't left what I do. I'm still in making recordings, but I've made a few less lately, partly because I was coughing. I had a bit of a cough, 
um, for a few weeks. But I did a deep sleep whisper hypnosis recorded earlier this morning and you know as soon as I did it the stats went up people it's a popular podcast and why am I not I haven't made one since the 19th of November and it's now the 2nd of December and that's one of my most popular podcasts so you know I need to perhaps focus a bit more on uh, helping others and producing more recordings than trying to figure out what my future is but you know the way I see it is my future there's some obvious things that are going to happen um, to all of us so I'm not going to dwell on that but outside of the inevitable and the future I would say is probably going to be a lot better than the past for me in quite a few ways you know having a home to live in and and I mention it's not like bragging because you know I suppose the majority of people do have a home to live in but there are people listening that perhaps don't and they've got high rent or they're living in a room. I did that for decades, so I do know what that's like to do that. I think I mention it more in a gratitudinal way. I'm kind of verbally showing gratitude because I do feel it when I say it. I probably feel it more when I say it than when I just think it. I don't know if that makes any sense. So I do feel grateful for having a home. Um, it's basically mine to lose, you know, in a sense of the only way I could get kicked out of here is if I started being antisocial. Um, and I'm not. I never have been. So, well, not at home. I think if you're going to be antisocial, you should do it outside in the street you know, in town, in public places, that's antisocial behaviour, as far as I'm concerned, that's where it should be, not it should be, but that's the, you know, not at home, I like to have a break from causing chaos when I'm at home, <laughs> no, I'm not a chaos person, mentally sometimes a little bit chaotic, but generally not, you could say actually the way I talk is, uh, my conversational directions could be almost chaotic at, at times. I'm not sure, really. But there's no way if you let me know anymore, is there? Because I got rid of the website. Um, but that was a blip. But I didn't know it was going to cost me £135 or whatever to get the thing back. So that's gone. And... But my Facebook page is still there. I've got my Facebook page, my Twitter page. Uh, there's, there's three Facebook pages. There's my ordinary personal Facebook page. But by saying that, I don't really have any friends or family on there. I've got a couple of friends on there, but no family. Uh, it's mainly just for people that listen to my stuff. And I've got friends, you know, Facebook friends that I've made you know over the last 13 years or whatever so that's it's wrong for me to say they're not friends because there are people there that I do kind of contact and have a you know every now and then but uh, people that I probably would be friends with in real life if I lived in their area or their country even you know but I don't I live here And, what's the other thing? I've got a Facebook page. Like an actual page page. Uh, where, well, I've got about 29,000 
likes on that page or followers or whatever so that's I always post everything I do on there doesn't get a huge response to be fair but I think people they just click on the link and go to the podcast it's you know there's not much because I produce um, even really I would say even when I'm not producing much I'm still producing more than probably most people I'm still you can still say I'm fairly prolific even when I don't make many because I still do 10 10 plus a week probably even on a slow week perhaps maybe not I don't know I was looking at the stats of I had 54 download 54,000 downloads in October and just over 50,000 downloads in November so I want to try and get to this I want to get 60 or 70,000 in December so I'll do a few extra sessions but the thing is I get so caught up like when I do a website it's almost like I'm a I get stuck in the groove or stuck on the track you know like a railway track and I can only go in the direction that the that the track's going and I got a little bit like that when it comes to building websites and really what I need or not need to but what I want to be doing is making more recordings and I just think like in 20 years time when I'm 69 it can't help it it just rhymes doesn't it when I'm 69 lucky number for some I I like to think that I'd like to look back on a, a work you know uh the content you know you know lots and lots of recordings uh, by then I'll probably have maybe 10,000 recordings done and I'd like to look back at that rather than look back at look how many times I've built and you know spent on building websites and and you know all that I don't want to be spending time doing that anymore although I kind of enjoy it I think part of the reason I enjoy it is because I can do that at the same time as watching telly I can't read and watch telly I can't listen to music and watch telly Maybe if I took up knitting. See, knitting is supposed to be really relaxing. And also, knitting is really good for your brain. Because you're using both sides of your brain at the same time. A bit like when you're playing the piano. Because your your left hand activates the right side of your brain. The right hand activates the left side of your brain. Usually. I say usually, I think some people have brains that are a bit different. But it's like, wow. So if I take up knitting, it can be relaxing. And also, when you use both sides of your brain, so when, when someone's got stress or anxiety, they're generally using one side of their brain predominantly really predominantly so when they start using both sides it's almost like a tennis tennis game you know the ball going over the net to either side of the brain which means it activates the other side which relieves the side which was had the stress in 
which causes relaxation, calmness and sleep in this situation possibly, you know, by activating both sides of the brain. So maybe listening to me also activates both sides of the brain, maybe. I'm not be surprised if it activates any part of the brain. If anything, it probably shuts down your brain. Yeah, that's probably what it is. That's why if I'm ever in a passenger seat of a car, I try not to talk. I'm just scared that they'll fall asleep. But, uh, right. There was a point to what I was saying. I don't know what it was. Oh, yeah. My nan used to knit and she used to watch telly while knitting. And she'd knit, she would, she'd knit a scarf during the news. So I had this. Mind you, she used to make these um, polar neck jumpers, especially at Christmas. And I think sometimes it would be a Christmas jumper with a reindeer on the front, you know, or Father Christmas, Santa, whatever you want to call him, and Santa in a manger, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, they were, even though I was little, you know, I was always little when I was a kid. It's almost like, like a, a stunted growth or something. I could never get my head through the hole of the... Well, I, I did eventually, but I was literally just gasping for breath. So it was almost like every time... Every Christmas, I open that present... You know, hoping that it'd be something different. Like, oh, please, what's my name got me this year? Please, please let it just be some stinging nettles or something. Just, that's got to be better than the jumper. And she said, uh, she she said, that's rude. I said, oh, I didn't realise I was talking out loud. She said, well, you were. And she chucked a big bit of tuna at me. No, she didn't. And... I think the problem was I had this I had a human head which sounds like a strange sentence I had a human you had a human head what does that mean I don't understand I had a human size head maybe an adult size head or a normal child's size head for my age but an unusually small body I've caught up, you know, I don't have a particularly tiny body now, but it's an ever-growing body these days. It's not that bad. I've got okay legs. <laughs> I don't even know what, what, why, am I, why am I saying that. I think I've got quite, um, I think if you saw a picture just of the top of me like from my belly button upwards or from me the crease the the belly crease where water can hide sometimes I have to pick it, lift it up when I get out of the bath and the water drips down it's uh anyway I, if you did that you'd think I bet oh, if you said what kind of legs do you reckon he's got and you probably think, I've got chubby legs. And then if you were just shown a picture of my legs, just separate, a, di a separate group, let's say we've got two different groups, not groups as in bands playing music, but groups of people, like a, a study group, not studying a subject, just, you know. But anyway, if, they, if you showed a picture just of my legs, so from... No, unless I was I was naked, my legs were naked, and my feet, or up to 
the tops of my thighs, let's say. Um, and if you said, well, what, what type of body has he got, upper body, you, not you, because you, you, you know that I'm not slim, but the person would probably think that I was slim because I've got slim legs. Or at least they might say, I bet he's got a human shaped body. Again, I'd be wrong, but you know, they'd, they'd, they'd guess wrongly because my legs are kind of, they're clearly strong because it's carrying this weight around. I mean, the strongest part of my body is my legs, clearly. Because it's carrying 15, what have I, I think I'm 98 kilos, whatever that is, 15.25 stone or something. So it's 98 kilos. I'm only 5'8", by the way, I'm not I'm not 6 foot 2, which would be, I think 6 foot 8 would be the right height for my weight, I think. No, <laughs> I think... My ideal weight for my height is 11 and a half stone. The last time I was 11 and a half stone was when I lo lost loads of weight and got really fit in 2004. And I went down to 11 and a half stone. And I was doing um, Wing Chun Kung Fu three times a week. I was working in a, at a, a a part time job, but it was physical. I was like moving around a lot and unloading and packing and um like in this retail shop, so I was on my feet most of the time. I was also a vegetarian, which meant that well i was I got to know the toilet quite quite intimately you know I was, I was in and out quite often so I got down to 11 and a half stone from probably at that point I was probably about 13 and a half before that point so I lost about two stone and I was probably at my I'm not going to say at my fittest because my fittest probably would have been when I was a teenager realistically when I was probably 14 15 um, but from a kind of a as an adult that was probably the fittest I've been up to that point and then what year is it 2004 and then I went back to sales insurance working in an insurance company and I remember thinking to myself I'm so slim now I wonder if I'll put weight on sitting in here eating food all day which is kind of an obvious uh, answer to that and I did indeed put weight on not straight away though so for the first few months I was fine and then blah 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 I was just so I went up to, well actually when I left, when I left, when I moved here, not this place, but to this town to do my university course, I was 13 and a half stone. So I never went above, above 13 and a half. And that was enough, that was heavy enough for me. And... I didn't really want to be heavier than that. I was okay with 13 and a half. I, I kind of grew into it, you know. I kind of was okay with it. Uh, did exercise, weights and stuff. So I was, I was okay. I wasn't just this big walking blob. But then, 2007... end of 2007 I didn't realise I put weight on 
And in 2009, I went and weighed myself and I was over 14. I think I was 14 and a half stone or over 14 stone, something like that. But I was bloated. I just had this big meal, burgers and chips and stuff. I just, so that didn't help. Didn't help how I was feeling because I had sat, I weighed myself in, I think it was in uh, the Boots Chemist and they had a weighing machine. So I thought, well, I'll just weigh myself. Or it might be down in the toilet. I, didn't, I don't mean the toilet weighed me, but they had a, a weighing machine in Liverpool Street Station bogs. <laughs> and I love that word, bogs, crapper. Thing is, the crapper, that sounds rude, but that's the name of the person who invented the toilet. So it's not rude at all. And um, Mr. Crapper. <laughs> Can you imagine? You invent something to help people. And it's one of the greatest inventions of all time. You know, I've made, you know obviously penicillin has got to be above it. And, you know, but outside of medical stuff, the penicillin... Um, the toilet is one of the greatest all-time creations, inventions, as far as, well, actually, not just for ease and comfort and stuff, but actually, it also saved probably millions of people's lives. Because, you know, there was a time when people used to just do it in a bucket and then chuck it out in the street. So... It's the jacket out the window. So, you know, it's one of the greatest inventions ever. And Mr. Crapper, who invented it, probably thought, you know what, my name, when anyone hears the name Crapper, they're going to think of me, and they're going to think of all the good that I did in the world and how I uh, changed the hygienic and sanitary situation in towns and villages and cities all across the world saving probably millions of lives over the years had it not been for this invention and just Or, you know, people are just going to... There'll be, be statues up for me. and there'll be My name will just be connected with everything that's good. In fact, they might just call me by my... You know, they might just... Like my friends call me crap. So I would say, I'm going to go for a crap. And, and it'll be like... They feel like they're part of me, my friend, you know, they kind of, it's a genuine kind of love there. When people say, I'm going for, a, I'm going to do a crap, and they're going to be talking about, I'm going to invent something amazing, I'm going to create something. So when people are going for a crap, they're creating something amazing that's going to be useful to the world. That's what going for a crap's going to mean creating something useful. And then, then there's all, when things are going really good, and it's going really well, people are going to be saying, oh, it's going down the crapper. It's, it's going really well, because it's so successful, just like Mr. Crapper. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I'm waiting for my chair to be delivered. So it's another big black chair, recliner, and 
I'm going to be sitting in there and making recordings. So I'm really, I would say fingers crossed, but I'm going to have to, I'm pretending I'm crossing my fingers. I hope it's comfy. And then I can hopefully just make lots of recordings sitting in there, just chilling out. And the ones that need to be really quiet, because I, I don't, I know ideally there'd be no background sound in any recording ever, but, um, but this, I don't know, I kind of don't want to. I don't, I've got this shed, which is going to be the recording studio for ideally the whisper stuff and some of the long sleep, like the deep uh, sleep hypnosis weekly ones. But when I'm making these recordings, I like to be a bit more freer and have something to look at. that makes sense I feel more comfortable in my chair in the living room looking around Andre running around now and then and um, just with some space because it just feels nicer I prefer to do all of the recordings like this but doesn't fit together with some of the really quiet stuff that I do you know like the whisper stuff so I'm going to work on the web the uh, it'll probably be next year now because it's December and every penny I've got is probably going to go towards buying presents for family and that I've got three three four nieces and nephews I've got uh, one niece which is she's fairly old now she's about 10 or 11 I've got twins niece and nephew who are about two and I've got another niece who's Oh, just over a year, and so yeah, it's quite. A, I don't know what to do. I'm thinking I might buy stuff on the catalogue, so I can just pay it off. You know, sort of over a few months. But it's just I don't know. With my niece, my. The, the the newest one the newest one the newest one she was very very poorly really ill for quite a long time so at the beginning of this year she was in um, hospital in London for a few months so just I know she won't remember it as she gets older but she's experiencing it in the moment you know it does so I don't know I kind of would like to get her something a bit special but I don't know what it's part part of me I kind of like want to get educational stuff when the reality is they probably don't want educational stuff they just want a, something to play with you know a toy you know, something that's fun and like with my dad all, all I've got to do to get him is just a bottle of whiskey and he's happy but in the past I bought him presents and thinking it would be a really nice present and he just wants a bottle of whiskey I mean I bought him the DVD this is a few years back I bought him DVDs every single James Bond film 
like a big box of James and there's quite a few of them there's like 30 or something so every single James Bond film on DVD and I gave him it in a package and it was quite a long package and he opened it up and he opened the top up first and he looked down and I could see the look of disappointment in his eyes when he saw that it wasn't scotch because it looked like a bottle a box of scotch you know scotch whiskey inside one of those boxes <sighs> so I'll probably get him some whiskey <laughs> that probably makes sense but I'd like to get him some nice whiskey you know something just like a hundred years old or something but one day I will I'd like to get him uh, you know you can get really old stuff like hundreds of years old but it's expensive but whiskey's his hobby though it's actually it's not like scotch it's not just something he drinks he's visited uh, distilleries in Scotland and he's just he loves it. He loves everything to do with, with scotch. Single malt is what he likes. So I'll get him something. Um, I don't think I can buy alcohol in the catalogue though. I don't think they sell that stuff. So I'll have to pay for that. What should I get for my... See, my brother, he says, for my niece, he said... He's very organised. You know, we're talking October time, I think. He was talking about Christmas presents. Sort of who's getting her what and just like who's getting his, his daughter presents and what are they getting? Like, I don't know what I'm going to get, but we kind of agreed. I, I can kind of see where he's coming from, I suppose, if I put some effort in. I suppose he he doesn't want to get the same stuff as what other people get at her. So I'm going to get her a doll. I'm kind of doll, dolly, doll, something. Because she hasn't got one, apparently. My niece, the oldest one, I'll probably get her a book. Or... Maybe a book token or something, I don't know. What, what was I thinking of getting everybody? It might sound a bit strange, but I thought of buying everybody in the family the same present and just wrapping it up and just, when they open it up, just the the look on their faces as they realised that I bought them um, toilet wet wipes wet wipes for their bum android toilet wipes or whatever they're called I thought that would be a, a, both an amusing present but also useful at the same time because they're like oh Jason what a crap present <laughs> crap and it's like oh rubbish present yeah, very funny, ha, ha, ha. But at the same time, however, I'm going to have a clean bum. So it, it, it kind of, you know, it works. So I might do that. Um, but I don't know. I think if I do that, I think I'm going to do it after I've had dinner. Because if I give my stepmum that as a present, I don't think she's going to want to feed me <laughs> afterwards. I don't think she's. I can't imagine her. She want to give me any food for dinner, so I will wait until afterwards to give the presents out. I wonder what else I could buy them. I mean, I could try and if I could keep it cheap as much as possible. I could buy boxes of Maltesers for everyone and some sweets and just put a, a package of chocolate and stuff together that 
maybe costs five pound for each person. But then, oh, squeaky chair, squeaky chair. How many people have I got? Uh, so parents. So I've got no grandparents anymore to buy for, unfortunately. So. Who else is there? There's my brother, my brother and my sister. And me four nieces and nephews. So that's nine people. Is there anyone else that I need to buy for? Probably my friend. That's it. What I would like to do and I've been thinking of doing this for the last four years, but I never got around to doing it. I'd like to buy some, you know those um, tin selections of chocolates, like Quality Street, you might not have them in your country, but uh, Quality Street or Roses, uh, uh, what's the other one? Quality Street, I'm trying to picture them. That usually comes in a tin, I think. Roses. I think that now it comes in a plastic thing rather than a tin. It used to come in a tin. Um, yeah, so that kind of thing anyway. There's other ones. I'm just trying to think what they are. They're not something that I would potentially really buy very often. But I thought about getting a few of those tins or, you know, of uh, chocolates and stuff and give them one to the doctor's surgery, one to the A&E in the hospital, one to, not the dentist, because that probably wouldn't be a good present, would it? To <laughs> give them chocolate. Um, plus, but I don't like the dentist. <laughs> Just... <laughs> It's, no one does, do they? It's weird, isn't it? It's so important. Dentists are so important in our society. But they're the least... They're almost... They're below traffic wardens when it comes to sort of loving them, you know, even though they do such a great job. Um, also, I'd like perhaps take one to the charity that helped me to get my flat. Um, because they they helped me it was a housing charity give one to the council for giving me the flat take one to the housing people in the library because they were really good and helped me during that process I'd like to take one to my social worker that helped me get this flat as well but I don't know where she is. I don't think she works there anymore. So I'll have to leave that one out, but uh, get one for the mental health team. A box of chocolates and stuff. And maybe one for the garage, the local garage where I just see them like you know regularly in my although I don't particularly like the garage itself but because it doesn't always have what I need but I said the doctor's surgery didn't I yeah I would say my doctor but I've got no idea who my doctor is so that'd be seven seven boxes and even when they're the they're cheapest, they're like five quid, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five. So it's over ten pound. And but now, when you come up to Christmas, they put stuff up. So a lot of stuff is discounted, isn't it? It's always like, oh, uh, got a special sale on before Christmas and like clothes and stuff like that. But when it comes to food and chocolate, that goes up in price.
The reason I don't know who my doctor is is because it's not because I can't pronounce her name. It's because well I can't, but she she's not my doctor. If that may, I I had since I was at that surgery since two thousand and seven, because I moved to where the town I'm in, November two thousand and seven. And then early 2008, I had a chest infection. So I went to the doctor's, which was in the area, and I signed up and, you know, got seen and everything. And was, you know, uh, part of that surgery. And in that time... I think I've had three doctors come and go. And now, yeah, I had. I had one doctor, it's very strict, who always used to moan at me saying, you need to know what medication you're on. You need to be able to tell me what medication you're on. I say, look, you, you prescribed it to me. You got it written down on your computer screen. Why do you need me to tell you? He said, don't answer back. I was a bit scared, so I, I didn't. And then they had this, so he left. And I had another doctor. And he he was there for a couple of years. Or th- he was there during 2000 and... Uh, 13 when I was uh, not very well so he was there and I was seeing him pretty much every week for a while and I had to get sick notes for the from the doctor for my work so I used to go in there every week uh, on a Monday morning and then he left and he was really he was nice then we had another lady not another lady, I had a lady come. I didn't see her very often because uh, most of my medications were the mental health team. So I see a psychiatrist once a year as a my medicine, medical review, and just to check everything's okay. The doctor can't actually change my medication, he's not allowed to. The GP cannot increase my medication or decrease it or stop it hasn't got the power psychiatrist is the only one that can do that well, and me as well obviously if I just decide to stop taking stuff and so that doctor who I didn't see very often she was nice um, I couldn't pronounce her name it was, very, it was quite a long name um, but she was lovely and she, she left The doctor who I saw in 2011, I was, I was, went to a doctor again and she put me on antidepressants and referred me to the mental health t- t- for a, a review, psychiatric review or whatever it's called and I still got a letter that she she sent me a copy that she sent to the mental health place Uh, and it was like it's like I've just seen this lovely gentleman he's um, he's a practicing counsellor which I was at the time and he's been in and out of depression and had anxiety and stuff since 1995 been prescribed medication on and off since 1995 and I I think it's it's time that he and she went into detail about my past because she gave she gave me quite an in-depth uh uh, interview which has surprised me 
and she remembered it all. She wasn't writing it down, she just remembered it. So I, it was a really nice letter. Hard reading sometimes, but yeah, it was nice, you know, what she said about me. And she sent me to the this place and that's when they diagnosed me with bipolar in December 2011. So it's literally what? 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So eight years now. I think it was something like the 2nd of December 2011, which is today. Isn't that weird? So it's been eight years I've been diagnosed with this condition. And I got re-diagnosed as well, so 2013, because I got given medication and I just didn't take it because I couldn't function. I wanted to be able to function to be, you know, I had the antidepressants, but not the other stuff. And uh, and then I went back to a different psychiatrist and they diagnosed me again, even though I was already diagnosed. I was like, okay, how many times are you gonna diagnose me? And uh, the I think it's because I hadn't been with the mental health team. I hadn't kind of participated in any of the medication that they wanted me to do or anything. So the dog barking in the background. Anyway, there was a point to this. Oh, the doctors. So this lady, the the one that you could say pretty much changed my life in a sense of I ended up with a diagnosis initially ignoring it in 2011 but then then not being able to ignore it in 2013 um, so she left as well she retired I think about a year or two ago. And the doctor's surgery, they've not allocated me anybody. Because I don't go in there. I don't, and they moan at me. They're saying, you know, they give me these, they call them batches of medication. So I've got this medication that's for life, you know, pretty much, unless they find a, a cure for bipolar, but this is, it's medication, and I'm going to be on them possibly for the rest of my life, that or something else, which is all right, I suppose. I don't not, don't know. But the doctor's surgery, who write the prescription out, they give me these batches that last for six months, and they send it to the, the pharmacy. The pharmacy just once a month sends me an, a text message to say, come and collect your prescription. And then at the end, when it comes to the fifth month, they say, or the sixth month, you have to go back to your surgery, doctor's surgery, and get them to do another batch, which is what I do. And practically every time they say, you have to come in and have a, a medicine review, medication review. And I said, why? They said, because you have to have that in order for us to prescribe again and I said I'm prescribed by the psychiatrist doesn't matter you've got to count I said yeah but the doctor's surgery the doctor can't change my prescription you have to give me the prescription because the doc because the psychiatrist has prescribed it I need this medication and It's got nothing to do with the doctor's surgery. And they said, sort of, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then they said to me, well, we'll give you one medication for this month, but you still have to come in. The doctor's insisting on seeing you. I said, why? Why, what possible reason? 
you know what she said to me? The, the receptionist, she said, it's because every patient has to come into the surgery at least once a year to be seen by a doctor. So I booked it in October. I'm seeing them this week. So six weeks it took for me to get an appointment. Yet, yeah. on the news, constantly we're being told that the doctors are overstaffed and they've got too many patients and they can't, don't have enough time to see everybody and there's big waiting lists. There's going to be a big waiting list if every single patient has to go in once a year, regardless of whether they need to or not. Because you think if every doctor surgery, let's say, has, I don't know, 10,000 patients in the area, that might not be that many, but let's say if it is like probably 5,000 at least, that's 5,000 appointments that last 10 minutes every year. See, I can't do the maths because I don't have a calculator to do it with. But that's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot of, that's a lot of hours. I mean, 10, basically five they're going to see five people an hour realistically probably four you know because they do overlap but let's say five they're not going to see six they have to have a break and there's appointments go on further than need to so or maybe as long as they need to rather so let's say five people an hour per doctor So that's a thousand hours. A thousand doctor hours per year just to see people that don't even need to be seen. I mean, I don't want to go to the doctors if I don't need to. I'm with the mental health team. I go to psychology. I've got a psychologist that I see every two weeks. I don't... Why would I want to go to the doctor? I just, you know... I feel what I'm going to do, actually. I'm going to speak to my psychologist and explain it to her and just say, look, can we just bypass the doctor's surgery and just send an ongoing prescription to the pharmacy from the psychologist or from the psychiatrist. I mean, she can prescribe me as well. But um, yeah, she's, she's a doctor, so I think she could probably prescribe me the medication, but I don't know if she'd be allowed to change it. She might be, I don't know. Yeah. So my chair is supposed to be between four and six. I reckon it'll be here soon. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it in my bones. Yes, oh yes, oh yes. I'm feeling it. I'm hearing sounds. So anyway, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye.